the Mercury Theater on the air. <laughs> Columbia Broadcasting System takes pleasure in presenting Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in the ninth and last of a unique summer series of Monday evening broadcasts, a series which has marked radio's first presentation of a complete theatrical producing company. Again tonight, the regularly affiliated stations of the Columbia Broadcasting System are joined for this program by a coast-to-coast network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This evening... Our play is Mr. Wells' own adaptation of G.K. Chesterton's famous novel, The Man Who Was Thursday. But just before it begins, here is the director of the Mercury Theater, the star and producer of these broadcasts, Orson Wells. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. G.K.C. Gilbert Keith Chesterton, great, greatly articulate Roman convert and liberal, has been dead now for two years. For a unique brand of common sense enthusiasm, for a singular gift of paradox, for a deep reverence and a high wit, and most of all for a free and shamelessly beautiful English prose, he will never be forgotten. It must be wonderful to be famous. According to the story, that's what the young lady said to the fat man, the fabulously fat, the fantastic, the famous fat man, when he took her to lunch at a fashionable restaurant and everybody turned and stared. Tell me, she said, do people always recognize you? Does everybody always know who you are? Well, my dear, said Mr. Chesterton, if they don't, they ask. Mr. Chesterton's The Man Who Was Thursday is a little like that. Roughly speaking, it's about anarchists. It was written, remember, in the boom of bomb throwing in those radical, irresponsible days of the nihilists. And roughly speaking, it's a mystery story. It can be guaranteed that you will never, never guess the solution until you get to the end. It is even feared that you may not guess it then. You may never guess what the man who was Thursday is about, but definitely, if you don't, you'll ask. I am Gabriel Syme. I am the man who was Thursday. That particular evening, if it is to be remembered for nothing else, will be remembered in that place for its strange sunset. It looked like the end of the world. All the heavens seemed covered with a quite vivid and palpable plumage. You could only say that the sky was full of feathers, and of feathers that almost brushed the face. And that evening may be remembered by others because it marked the first appearance in the place of the second poet of Saffron Park. For a long time, a red-haired revolutionary had reigned without a rival. It was upon the night of the sunset that his solitude suddenly ended. It may well be, Mr. Gabriel Syme, on such a night of clouds and cruel colors that there is brought forth upon the earth such a portent as a respectable poet. You say you are a poet of law, Mr. Syme. I say you are a contradiction in terms. An artist is identical with an anarchist. It is things going right that is poetical. Our digestions, for instance, going sacredly and silently right. That is the foundation of all poetry. The most poetical thing in the world is not being sick. (laughs) Really? The examples you choose? I beg your pardon. I forgot we had abolished all conventions. Well, you don't expect me to revolutionize society on this long. No, I don't. But I suppose that if you were serious about your anarchism, that is exactly what you would do. Don't you think, then, that I am serious about my anarchism? I beg your pardon. Am I not serious about my anarchism? My dear fellow, I strolled away. With surprise, but with a curious pleasure, I found a red-headed young lady still in my company. It was Rosamund Gregory, the red-headed poet's sister. Mr. Syme, do people who talk like you and my brother often mean what they say? Do you mean what you say now? (laughs) My dear Miss Gregory, when you say, thank you for the salt, do you mean what you say? No. When you say the world is round, do you mean what you say? No. It is true, but you don't mean it. Is he really an anarchist, then? Only in that sense I speak of, or if you prefer it, in that nonsense... He wouldn't really use bombs or that sort of thing. Oh, good Lord, no. That has to be done anonymously. I strolled with her to a seat in the corner of the garden and defended respectability with violence and exaggeration. I grew passionate in my praise of tidiness and propriety. All the time, there was a smell of lilac all around me. Once I heard very faintly in some distant street a barrel organ begin to play, and it seemed to me that my heroic words were moving to a tiny tune from under or beyond the world. 
In the wild events which were to follow, this girl had no part at all. I never saw her again until my tale was over. And yet in some in indescribable way, she kept recurring like a motive in music through all those mad adventurers afterwards. And the glory of her strange hair ran like a red thread through those dark and ill-drawn tapestries of the night. For what followed was so improbable that it might well have been a dream. When I left the party and went out into the starlit street, I found Gregory waiting for me. Mr. Syme. Mr. Gregory. This evening you succeeded in doing something rather remarkable. You did something to me that no man born of woman has ever succeeded in doing before. Indeed. Yes, now I remember. One other person succeeded in doing it. The captain of a penny steamer, if I remember correctly, at South End. You have, have irritated me. Oh, I'm very sorry. There's only one way by which that insult can be erased. And that's why I choose. I'm going at the possible sacrifice of my life and honor to prove to you that you were wrong in what you said. In what I said? You said I was not serious about being an anarchist. Mr. Syme, may I ask you to swear by whatever gods or saints your religion involves that you will not reveal what I'm now going to tell you to any son of Adam, and especially not to the police? Will you swear that? If you will consent to burden your soul with a vow that you should never make and a knowledge you should never dream about, I will promise you in return. You will promise me in return? I will promise you a very entertaining evening. <laughs> Your offer is far too idiotic to be declined. You say that a poet is always an anarchist. I disagree. But I hope at least that he's always a sportsman. Permit me here and now to swear as a Christian and promise as good a comrade and fellow artist that I will not report anything of this, whatever it is, to the police. And now, what is it? I think that we will call a cab. The cab pulled up before a particularly dreary and greasy beer shop. We seated ourselves in a close and dim sort of bar parlor at a stained wooden table with one wooden leg. Mr. Syme, if in a few moments this table begins to turn around a little, please don't put it down to the champagne. I don't wish you to do yourself an injustice. Well, if I'm not drunk, I'm mad, but I trust I can behave like a gentleman in either condition. May I smoke? Certainly. Try one of mine. I took the cigar and started to light it. Almost before I had begun, the table at which we were sitting began to revolve, first slowly and then rapidly. You must not mind it. It's a kind of screw. Quite so, a kind of screw. How simple that is. The next moment, we two with our chairs and table shut down to the floors that the earth had swallowed us. We went rattling down a kind of roaring chimney as rapidly as the lift cut loose, and we came with an abrupt bump to the bottom. Gregory led me down a low vaulted passage at the end of which was a heavy iron door. Who is it? Mr. Joseph Chamberlain. The heavy hinges began to move. It was obviously some kind of password. Inside the doorway, the passage gleamed as if it were lined with a network of steel. I saw that the glittering pattern was made up of rifles and revolvers. I must ask you to forgive me all these formalities. We have to be very strict here. We passed through several such passages and came out at last into a queer steel chamber with something of the appearance of a scientific lecture hall. There were no rifles or pistols in this apartment, but round the walls of it were hung more dubious and dreadful shapes, things that looked like the bulbs of iron plants or the eggs of iron birds. They were bombs. And now, my dear Mr. Symes, now we are quite cozy, so let us talk properly. You said you were quite certain I was not a serious anarchist. But does this place strike you as being serious? It does seem to have a moral under all its gaiety. But tell me, you have a heavy iron door. You can't pass it without submitting to the humiliation of calling yourself Mr. Joseph Chamberlain. You surround yourself with steel instruments, which make the place, as I may say so, more impressive than homelike. Why, after taking all this trouble to barricade yourselves in the bowels of the earth, you then parade your whole secret by talking about anarchism to every silly woman in Saffron Park? The answer is simple. When first I became one of the new anarchists, I tried all kinds of respectable disguises. I dressed up as a bishop. When on my first appearing in Episcopal Gators in a drawing room, I cried out in a voice of thunder, down, down, presumptuous human reason, they found out in some way that I was not a bishop at all. Then I made up as a millionaire. But I, but I defended capitalism with such intelligence that a fool could see that I was quite poor. At last I went in despair to the president of the Central Anarchist Council, who is the greatest man in Europe. And uh, what's his name? Uh, you would not know it. That is his greatness. He looked at me. Oh, you want a safe disguise, do you? You want a dress which will guarantee you harmless, a dress in which no one would ever look for a bomb. I nodded. Why then, dress up as an anarchist, you fool, he said. 
Nobody will ever expect you to do anything dangerous then. I took his advice and have never regretted it. I preach blood and thunder to those women day and night, and by God, they would let me wheel their perambulators. You took me in? Why do, you, why do you call this tremendous president, of course? We generally call him Sunday. You see, there are seven members of the Central Anarchist Council, and they're named after the days of the week. He's called Sunday. By some of his admirers, Bloody Sunday. It's curious that you should mention the matter, because the very night you've dropped in, if I may <laughs> so express it is the night on which our London branch, which assembles in this very room, has to elect its own deputy to fill a vacancy in the council. Now, the gentleman who has for some time past played with propriety and general applause the difficult part of Thursday has died quite suddenly. Consequently, we've called a meeting this very evening to elect a successor. I don't mind telling you that it's practically certain what the result will be. It's almost a settled thing that I... I'm to be thirsty. Oh, my dear fellow, I congratulate you. A great career. Well, as a matter of fact, everything's ready for me on this table, and the ceremony will probably be the shortest possible. I strolled across to the table and found lying across it a walking stick, which turned out to be a sword stick, a large Colt's revolver, a sandwich case, and a formidable flask of brandy. Over the chair beside the table was thrown a heavy little cape or cloak. I've only to get the form of election finished, and then I snatch up this cloak and stick, stuff these other things into my pockets, take up, step out of a door in this cavern which opens on the river, where there is a tug already waiting for me, and then, oh, then, the wild joy of being thirsty. Gregory, I gave you a promise before I came into this place. Would you give me, for my own safety, a little promise of the same kind? Promise? Yes, a promise. I swore before God that I wouldn't tell your secret to the police. Will you swear by humanity or whatever beastly thing you believe in that you will not tell my secret to the anarchists? Your secret? Have you got a secret? Yes, I have a secret. Will you swear? Yes. I will swear not to tell the anarchists anything you tell me. Now, look sharp. They'll be here in a couple of minutes. Well, Gregory, I don't know how to tell you the truth more shortly than by saying that your... that uh, your expedient of dressing up as an aimless port is not confined to you or your president. We have known the Dodge for some time at Scotland Yard. What do you say? Yes, Gregory. I am a police detective. Mr. Joseph Chamberlain? Mr. Joseph Chamberlain. It was repeated twice and thrice Joseph and then Chamberlain. 30 times. Chamberlain. And the crowd of Joseph Mr. Chamberlain's Chamberlain. solemn thought could be heard trampling down the corridor. Come now, Gregory, put down that gun. Don't you see we've checkmated each other? I can't tell the police you're an anarchist and you can't tell the anarchists I'm a policeman. The one solitary difference is in your favor. You're not surrounded by inquisitive policemen. I am surrounded by inquisitive animals. I cannot betray you, but I might betray myself. Here are your friends. Comrade Gregory, I suppose this man is a delegate? I'm glad to see that your gate is well enough guarded to make it hard for anyone to be here who was not a delegate. What branch do you represent? I should, uh, I should hardly call it a branch. I should call it, for the very least, a root. What do you mean? The fact is, I've been specially sent here to see that you show a due observance of Sunday. The little man dropped one of his papers and a flicker of fear went over all the faces of the group. Evidently, the awful president, whose name was Sunday, did sometimes send down such irregular ambassadors to such branch meetings. Well, comrade, I suppose we'd better give you a seat in the meeting. If you ask my advice as a friend, I think you'd better. Gregory, I could see, was in an agony of diplomacy. He could not himself betray me as a detective, partly from honor, but partly also because if he betrayed me and for some reason failed to destroy me, the detective who escaped would be a detective freed from all obligation of secrecy, a detective who could simply walk to the nearest police station. I think... Uh, I think it is time we began. The tug is waiting on the river already. I, I move that Comrade Buttons takes the chair. Second the motion. All those in favor? Motion carried. Comrade Buttons. Comrades, our meeting tonight is important. This branch has always had the honor of electing Thursdays for the Central European Council. We all lament the sad decease of the heroic worker who occupied the post until last week. As you know, his services to the cause were considerable. He organized the great dynamite coup of Brighton, which under happier circumstances ought to have killed everybody on the pier. As you also know, his death was as self-denying as his life, for he died through his faith in a hygienic mixture of chalk and water as a substitute for milk, which beverage he regarded as barbaric and as involving cruelty to the cow. Upon you, comrades, 
It devolves this evening to choose out of the company present the man who shall be Thursday. If any comrade suggests a name, I will put it to the vote. If no comrade suggests a name, I can only tell myself that that dear dynamiter who is gone from us has carried into the unknowable abyss the last secret of his virtue and his innocence. I move that comrade Gregory be elected Thursday. Does anybody second? Second of all, hmm. Before I put the matter to the vote, I will call on comrade Gregory to make a statement. Gregory rose. He must have figured that his best chance was to make a soft and an ambiguous speech, such as would leave in my mind the impression that the Brotherhood was a very mild affair after all. Comrade! We have no chance of denying the mountainous slanders which are heaped upon our heads from one end of Europe to another. For it is deep, deep under the earth that the persecuted are permitted to assemble as the Christians assembled in the catacombs. Suppose we seem as shocking as the Christians because we are really as harmless as the Christians. Suppose we seem as mad as the Christians because we are really as meek. I am not meek. Comrade Witherspoon tells us that he is not meek. Ah, how little he knows himself. His words are indeed extravagant. His appearance is ferocious and even to an ordinary taste unattractive. But only the eye of a friendship as deep and delicate as mine can perceive the deep foundation of solid meekness which lies at the base of him, too deep even for himself to see. I repeat, we are the two early Christians only that we come too late. We are simple as they were simple. Look at Comrade Witherspoon. We are modest as they were modest. Look at me. We are merciful. No, no. I say we are merciful as the early Christians were merciful. Yet this did not prevent their being accused of eating flesh. Now, we do not eat human flesh. Shame, why not? Comrade Witherspoon is anxious to know why nobody eats him. In our society, at any rate, which loves him sincerely, which is founded on love... No, no, down with love. Which is founded on love? There will be no difficulty about the aims which we shall pursue as a body or which I should pursue were I chosen as the representative of that body. Does anyone oppose the election of Comrade Gregory? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I oppose. Comrades, have we come here for this? Do we live underground like rats in order to listen to talk like this? No. No. Do we line these walls with weapons and bar that door with death lest anyone should come here and hear Comrade Gregory saying to us, be good and you will be happy. Honesty is the best policy and virtue is its own reward. No. There was not a word in Comrade Gregory's address to which a curate could not have listened with pleasure. No. But I'm not a curate. No. And I did not listen to it with pleasure. The man who was fitted to make a good curate is not fitted to make a good wrestle at possible and efficient Thursday. Comrade Gregory has told us that we're not the enemies of society. But I say that we are the enemies of society, and so much the worse for society. We are the enemies of society, for society is the enemy of humanity, its oldest and most pitiless enemy. Comrade Gregory accuses me of hypocrisy. He knows as well as I do that I keep that I keeping all my engagements and doing nothing but my duty. I do not mince words. I do not pretend to. I say that Comrade Gregory is unfit to be Thursday for all his amiable qualities. He's unfit to be Thursday because of all of his amiable qualities. We do not want the Supreme Council of Anarchy infected with a maudlin mercy. And I say that rather than have Gregory and his milk and water methods on the Supreme Council, I would offer myself for election. <laughs> I do not go to the council to rebut that slander that calls us murderous. I go to earn it. To the priest who says these men are the enemies of religion. To the judge who says these men are the enemies of law. To the fat parliamentarian who says these men are the enemies of order and public decency. To all those I will reply, you are false kings, but you are true prophets. I am come to destroy you and to fulfill your prophecy. <laughs> Comrade Simon be appointed to the post. Stop all this, I tell you, stop it, it's all... Any one second, this amendment. I end all this. This man cannot be elected. He is... Yes, what is he? He... He is a man quite inexperienced in our work. I beg to second the election of Comrade Simon. Yeah, yeah. The amendment will, as usual, be put first. The question is that Comrade Simon... Comrade, I am not a madman. Oh... 
Comrades, I kneel to you. I throw myself at your feet. I implore you. Do not elect this man. Truth is so terrible, even in fetters, that for a moment my slender and insane victory swayed like a reed. Comrade Gregory commands. Comrade Gregory, this is really not quite dignified. The question is that Comrade Syme be elected to the post of Thursday on the General Council. Yeah. The roar rose like the sea, the hands rose like a forest. And three minutes afterwards, Mr. Gabriel Syme of the Secret Police Service was elected to the post of Thursday on the General Council of the Anarchists of Europe. Everyone in the room seemed to feel the tug waiting on the river, the sword stick and the revolver waiting on the table. The instant the election was ended and irrevocable, I had received the paper proving my election. They all sprang to their feet and the fiery groups moved and mixed in the room. I found myself somehow or other face to face with Gregory. You are a devil. And you are a gentleman. The boat is quite ready. Be good enough to step this way. He led me down a short iron-bound passage. At the end of the passage was a door which buttons opened sharply, showing a sudden blue and silver picture of the moonlit river that looked like a scene in a theater. Close to the opening lay a dark, dwarfish launch like a baby dragon with one red eye. Comrade Gregory, you have kept your word. You are a man of honor, and I thank you. You have kept it even down to a small particular. There was one special thing you promised me at the beginning of the affair in which you have certainly given me by the end of it. What do you mean? What did I promise you? A very entertaining evening. My name is really Gabriel Syme. I'm not merely a detective who pretends to be a poet. I'm really a poet who has become a detective. I come of a family of cranks. One of my uncles always walked about without a hat, and another had made an unsuccessful attempt to walk about with a hat and nothing else. Being surrounded with every conceivable kind of revolt from infancy, I had to revolt into something, so I revolted into the only thing left which was sanity. I walked on the embankment once under a dark red sunset. I was shabby in those days. Altogether, I looked a very satisfactory specimen of the anarchist upon whom I had vowed a holy war. Perhaps this was why a policeman on the embankment spoke to me. Good evening. A oh, good evening, is it? You fellows would call the end of the world a good evening. Look at that bloody red sun and that bloody river. I tell you that if there were literally human blood spilt and shining, you would still be standing here as solid as ever, looking out from some, for some poor harmless tramp who would, whom you could move on. You policemen are cruel to the poor, but I could forgive you even cruelty if it were not for your calm. If we are calm, it is the calm of organized resistance. Eh? The soldier must be calm in the thick of battle. Yeah. The composure of an army is the anger of a nation. Good God! How comes a man like you to be talking philosophy in a blue helmet on the Thames embankment? You evidently have not heard of the latest development in our police system. But you seem to be exactly in the right frame of mind. I think you might almost join us. Join you in what? I will tell you. The head of one of our departments, one of the most celebrated detectives in Europe, has long been of the opinion that a purely intellectual conspiracy would soon threaten the very existence of civilization. He has therefore formed a special corps of policemen, policemen who are also philosophers. The armies of anarchy are on our frontiers. Their bolt is ready to fall. Well, how can I join you? I know for a fact that there is a vacancy at the moment as I have the honor to be somewhat in the confidence of our chief. You should really come and see him, or rather I should not say see him. Nobody ever sees him. But you can talk to him if you like. Telephone? No. No, he has a fancy for always sitting in a pitch-dark room. He says it makes his thoughts brighter. I allowed myself to be led to a side door on the long row of buildings of Scotland Yard. Almost before I knew what I was doing, I had been passed through the hands of about four intermediate officials and was suddenly shown into a room, the abrupt blackness of which startled me like a blaze of light. It was not the ordinary darkness. It was like going suddenly stone blind. Are you the new recruit? All right. You're engaged. Well, I really have no experience. No one has any experience of the Battle of Armageddon. But I am really unfit. You are willing. That is enough. Well, really, I don't know any profession of which mere willingness is the final test. I do. Martyrs. I'm condemning you to death. Good day. When I left the police premises, my friend provided me with a small blue card in which was written The Last Crusade, the sign of my official authority. Where my adventure ultimately led me, I've already told you. At about half past one on a February night, I found myself steaming in a small tug up the silent Thames, armed with sword stick and revolver, the duly elected Thursday of the Central Council of Anarchists. 
The tug was worked by two men and with much toil went comparatively slowly. The clear moon that had lit up Chiswick had gone down by the time that we'd passed Battersea, and when we came under the enormous bulk of Westminster, day had already begun to break. It broke like the splitting of great bars of lead, showing bars of silver, and these had brightened like white fire when the tug, changing its outward course, turned inward to a large landing stage rather beyond Charing Cross. The great stones of the embankment were big and black against the huge white dawn. They made me feel that I was landing on the colossal steps of some Egyptian palace, and indeed the thing suited my mood, for I was, in my own mind, mounting to attack the solid thrones of horrible and heathen kings. I leapt out of the boat onto the slimy step. The two men in the tug put off again and turned upstream. They'd never spoken a word. There was a man leaning over the parapet of the embankment and looking out across the river. He was as motionless as a waxwork and got on the nerves somewhat in the same way. I took out of my pocket the note from Buttons proving my election and put it before that sad and beautiful face. Then the man smiled, and his smile was a shock, for it was all on one side, going up in the right cheek and down on the left. With the dark dawn and the deadly errand and the loneliness on the great dripping stones, there was something unnerving in it. There was the silent river and the silent man. And there was the last nightmare touch that his smile suddenly went wrong. If we walk up towards Leicester Square, we shall be in time for breakfast. Sunday always insists on an early breakfast. At one corner of Leicester Square, there projected a kind of angle of a prosperous but quiet hotel. In the wall, there was one large French window, and outside this window, almost literally overhanging the square, was a balcony big enough to contain a breakfast table. In fact, it did contain a breakfast table, and round the breakfast table, glowing in the sunlight and evident to the street, were a group of noisy and talkative men, all dressed in the insolence of fashion, with white waistcoats and expensive buttonholes. The secretary gave his unnatural smile, and either this boisterous breakfast party was the secret conclave of the European dynamiters. Then as I continued to stare at them, I saw something that I had not seen before, literally because it was too large to see. At the nearest end of the balcony, blocking up a great part of the perspective, was the back of a great mountain of a man. My first thought was that the weight of him must break down the balcony of stone. His vastness did not lie only in the fact that he was abnormally tall and quite incredibly fat. This man was planned enormously in his original proportions, like a statue carved deliberately as colossal. His head crowned with white hair, as seen from behind, looked bigger than a head ought to be. The ears stood out from it looked larger than human ears. He was enlarged terribly to scale, and his sense of size was so staggering that when I saw him, all the other figures seemed quite suddenly to dwindle and become dwarfish. They were still sitting there as before with their flowers and frock coats, but now it looked as if the big man was entertaining five children to tea. As we approached the side of the hotel, a waiter came out smiling with a tooth in his head. They do talk and they do laugh at what they talk. They do say they will throw bombs at the king. Then the waiter hurried away with a napkin over his arm, much pleased with the singular frivolity of the gentleman upstairs. I never thought of asking whether the monstrous man who almost filled and broke the balcony was the great president of whom the other stood in awe. I knew it was so. Twice already that night, little unmeaning things had peeped out to me and given me a sense of drawing nearer and nearer to the headquarters of hell, and this sense became overpowering as I drew nearer to the great president. As I walked across the inner room towards the balcony, the large face of Sunday grew larger and larger, and I was gripped with a fear that when he was quite close, the face would be too big to be possible and that I would scream aloud. I remember that as a child, I would not look at the Mask of Monmon in the British Museum because it was a face and so large. By an effort braver than that of leaping over a cliff, I went to an empty seat at the breakfast table and sat down. The men greeted me with good-humoured raillery as if they'd always known me. I sobered myself a little by looking at their conventional coats and solid, shining coffee pot, and then I looked again at Sunday. His face was very large, but it was still possible to humanity. In the presence of the president, the whole company looked sufficiently commonplace. Nothing about them caught the eye at first, except one. He, at least, was the common or garden dynamiter. Out of his collar there sprang a head quite unmistakable, a bewildering bush of brown hair and beard that almost obscured the eyes like those of a Sky Terrier. The man's name, it seemed, was Gogol. He was a Pole, and in this circle of days he was called Tuesday. When I came in the present, with that daring disregard of public suspicion, which was his policy, was actually chaff chaffing Gogol upon his inability to assume conventional graces. Our friend Tuesday insists on the ways of the stage conspirator. Now, if a gentleman goes about London in a top hat and a frock coat, no one need know that he's an anarchist. But if a gentleman puts on a top hat and a frock coat, and then it goes about on his hands and knees... Well, he may attract attention. That's what Brother Gogol does. Goes about on his hands and knees with such inexhaustible diplomacy that by this time he finds it quite difficult to walk upright. I am not good at concealment. I am not ashamed of the cause. Yes, you are, my boy. And so is the cause of you. I am not good at deception. Right, my boy, right. You aren't good at anything. 
But as I looked at the others, I began to see in each of them exactly what I'd seen in the man by the river. Each man was subtly and differently wrong. Next to me sat Tuesday, the tousle-head Gogol, a man more obviously mad. Next was Wednesday, a certain Marquis de saint eustache uh, in the gloom and thickness of his beard, a dark red mouth showed sensual and scornful. Whatever he was, he was not a Frenchman. In the bright-colored Persian tiles and pictures showing tyrants hunting, you may see just those cruel crimson lips. Then came me, and next a very old man, Professor de Worms, who still kept the chair of Friday, though every day it was expected that his death would leave it empty. The red flower in his buttonhole showed up against a face that was literally discolored like lead. The whole hideous effect was as if some drunken dandies had put their clothes upon a corpse. When he rose or sat down, which was with long labor and peril, I could not help thinking that whenever the man moved, a leg or arm might fall off. Right at the end sat the man called Saturday. He was a short, square man with a dark, square face, and his name was Dr. Bull. There was nothing whatever odd about him except that he wore a pair of dark, almost opaque spectacles. It may have been merely a crescendo of nervous fancy that had gone before, but those black discs were dreadful to me. They reminded me of a half-remembered ugly tale of some story about pennies being put on the eyes of the dead. They took away the key of the face. You couldn't tell what his smile or his gravity meant. It seemed to me that he might be the wickedest of all these wicked men. It occurred to me that eyes might be covered up because they were too frightful to see. Such were the six men who had sworn to destroy the world. The waiter had spoken correctly when he said they were talking about bombs and kings. Only three days afterward, the king was to meet the president of the French Republic in Paris. And over their bacon and eggs upon their sunny balcony, these beaming gentlemen had decided how both should die. Even the instrument was chosen. The black-bearded marquis, it appeared, was to carry the bomb. Most of the talkers paid a little attention to me, debating now with their faces closer together. But the president was always looking at me steadily and with a great and baffling interest. The enormous man was quiet, but his blue eyes stood out of his head, and they were always fixed on me. I wanted to spring up and leap over the balcony. I had hardly the shred of a doubt that in some silent and extraordinary way, Sunday had found out that I was a spy. I looked over the edge of the balcony and saw a policeman standing just beneath, staring at the bright railings and the sunlit trees. Then there fell upon me the temptation that was to torment me for many days. I remember now that I was still tied to Gregory by a great promise. I'd promised not to jump over that balcony and speak to the policeman. I had only to snap the thread of a rash vow made to a villainous society, and all my life could be as open and sunny as the square beneath me. I had, on the other hand, only to keep my antiquated honor and be delivered inch by inch into the power of this great enemy of mankind, whose very intellect was a torture chamber. Whenever I looked down into the square, I saw the comfortable policeman, a pillar of common sense and common order. And whenever I looked back at the breakfast table, I saw the president still quietly studying me with big, unbearable eyes. It never occurred to me to doubt that the president of this council could crush me if I continued to stand alone, either by anonymous poison or sudden street accident, by hypnotism or by fire from hell. Sunday could certainly strike me. If I defied the man, I was probably dead, either struck stiff there in his chair or long afterwards as by an instant ailment. If I could call in the police promptly, arrested everyone, told all, and set all against them the whole energy of England, I would probably escape, certainly not otherwise. They were a balcony full of gentlemen overlooking a bright and busy square, but I felt no more safe with them than if they had been a boat full of armed pirates overlooking an empty sea. The men were eating as they talked. The Marquis took a great bite of a slice of bread and jam. I have often wondered whether it wouldn't be better for me to do it with a knife. And it would be a new emotion to get a knife into a French president and wiggle it around. You are wrong. A knife was merely the expression of the old personal quarrel with a personal tyrant. Dynamite is not only our best tool, but our best symbol. It expands. It only destroys because it broadens. A man's brain is a bomb. My brain feels like a bomb, night and day. It must expand. It must expand. A man's brain must expand if it breaks up the universe. Oh, I don't want the universe broken up just yet. I want to do a lot of beastly things before I die. I thought of one yesterday in bed. Dr. Bull smiled his sphinx-like smile. Oh, no. Oh, if the only end of the thing is nothing, it hardly seems worth doing. The old professor was staring at the ceiling with dull eyes. Every man knows in his heart that nothing is worth doing. There was a singular silence. And then the secretary spoke. We are wandering, however, from the point. The only question is how Wednesday is to strike the blow. I take it we should all agree with the original notion of a bomb. As to the actual arrangements, I should suggest that tomorrow he should go first of all to... The speech was broken off short under a vast shadow. President Sunday had risen to his feet, seeming to fill the sky above us. Before we discuss that, let us into a private room. I have something very particular to say. The instance of choice had come at last. The pistol was at my head. On the pavement below, I could hear the policeman idly stir and stamp for the morning, although bright was cold. 
A barrel organ in the street sprang with a jerk into a jovial tune. I stood up taut. It was like a bugle before the battle. I found myself filled with a courage that came from nowhere. That jingling music seemed full of vivacity, the vulgarity, the irrational valor of the poor, when all those unclean streets were all clinging to the decencies and the charities of Christendom. I didn't think of myself as the representative of the corps of gentlemen turned into fancy policemen or of the old eccentric who lived in the dark room. But I did feel myself as the ambassador of all these common and kindly people in the street who every day marched into battle to the music of the barrel organ. And this high pride in being human had lifted me unaccountably to an infinite height above the monstrous men around me. For an instant at least I looked down upon their sprawling eccentricities from the starry pinnacle of the commonplace. If the people of the barrel organ could keep their old world obligations, so could I. It was my last triumph over these lunatics to go down to their dark room and die for something that they couldn't even understand. The conspirators were already filing through the open window into the rooms behind. I went last. The president led us down into regular side stair and into a dim, cold, empty room with a table and benches. When we were all in, he closed and locked the door. The first to speak was Gogol. So, so, you show yourselves. <laughs> when you want talk importance, you run yourselves in dark box. Sit down with the other gentlemen at this table. <laughs> the first time this morning, something intelligent is going to be said. I sat down first. Gogol sat down last, grumbling in his brown beard about compromise. No one except me seemed to have any notion of the blow that was about to fall. As for me, I had merely the feeling of a man mounting the scaffold with the intention, at any rate, of making a good speech. Comrades, we have spun out this fast long enough. We were discussing plans and naming places. I propose that those plans and places should not be voted by this meeting, but should be left wholly in the control of some one reliable member. I suggest, comrade, Saturday, Dr. Bull. Not one word more about the plans and places must be said at this meeting. Not one tiny detail more about what we mean to do must be mentioned in this company. Sunday had spent his life in astonishing his followers, but it seems as if he had never really astonished them until now. They all moved feverishly in their seats except me. I sat stiff in mind with my hand in my pocket and on the handle of my loaded revolver. I would find out at least if the president was mortal. You will probably understand that there is only one possible motive for forbidding free speech at this festival of freedom. Strangers overhearing us matter nothing. They assume that we are joking. But what would that matter, even under what would matter even under death is this, that there should be one actually among us who is not of us, who knows our grave purpose, but does not share it. Who It cannot be! There are cars! Yes, there is a spy in this room. There is a traitor at this table. I will waste no more words. His name... I half rose from my seat, my finger firm on the trigger. His name is Gogol. He is that airy humbug over there who pretends to be a foe. Gogol sprang to his feet, a pistol in each hand with the same flash three men sprang at his throat. Sit down. Well, my man, will you oblige me by putting your hand in your upper waistcoat pocket and showing me what you have there? The alleged Paul put two fingers into the pocket with an apparent coolness and pulled out a blue strip of card. It bore a startling resemblance to the blue card in my own pocket. The last crusade. Pathetic slam. Tragic child of Poland. Are you prepared in the presence of that card to deny that you are in this company? Shall we say, to throw? Right now. I gather that you fully understand your position. You bet. I say it's a fair cop. All I say is I don't believe any Pole could have imitated my accent like I did his. I uh, concede the point. I believe your own accent to be inimitable, though I shall practice it in my bath. You mind leaving your beard with your car? <laughs> Not a bit. And with one finger he ripped off the hold of a shaggy head covering, emerging with thin red hair and a pale pert face. It was hot. I'll do you the justice to say that you seem to have kept pretty cool under it. Now, listen to me. I like you. The consequence is that it would annoy me for just about two and a half minutes if I heard that you died in torments. Well, if you ever tell the police or any human soul about us, I shall have that two and a half minutes of discomfort. On your discomfort, I will not dwell. Good day. Mind the step. The red-headed detective who had masqueraded as Gogol rose to his feet without a word and walked out of the room with an air of perfect nonchalance. But there was a slight stumble outside the door which showed that the departing detective had not minded the step. Time is flying. I must get off at once. I have to take the chair at a humanitarian meeting. Would it not be better to discuss further the details of our project now that the spy has left us? No, I think not. Leave it as it is. Let Saturday settle it. I must be off. Breakfast here next Sunday. I must protest, President, that the thing is irregular. It is a fundamental rule of our society that all plans shall be debated in full council. 
Of course, I fully appreciate your forethought when the actual presence of a traitor... Secretary, if you take your head home and boil it for a turnip, it might be useful. I can't say, but it might. I really fail to understand. That's it. That's it. That's where you fail right enough. You fail to understand. Why, you dancing donkey. You didn't want to be overheard by a spy, did you? How do you know you aren't overheard now? With these words, he shouldered his way out of the room, shaking with incomprehensible scorn. Four of the men left behind gaped after him without an apparent glimmering of his meaning. I alone had even a glimmering, and such as it was, it froze me to the bone. If the last words of the president meant anything, they meant that I had, after all, not passed unsuspected. I had escaped a thunderbolt, but I was still under a cloud. The other four got to their feet grumbling, more or less, and betook themselves elsewhere to find lunch, for it was already past midday. The professor went last, very slowly and painfully. At last I rose and made my way to the hotel in Leicester Square. The bright, cold day had grown increasingly colder, and when I came out of the street, I was surprised by a few flakes of snow. I stepped back out of the street for a moment and stood up under the doorway of a small and greasy hairdresser shop, in that I was astonished to see the paralytic old Professor de Worms. Scarcely seemed the place for a person of his years and infirmities. I could only suppose that the man's malady, whatever it was, involved some momentary fits of rigidity or trance. I was not inclined, however, to feel in this case any very compassionate concern. On the contrary, I rather congratulated myself that the professor's stroke and his elaborate and limping walk would make it easy to escape from him and leave him miles behind. For I thirsted first and last to get clear of the whole poisonous atmosphere, if only for an hour. I strolled away through the dancing snow, turned up two or three streets, down through two or three others, and entered a small Soho restaurant for lunch. The wines, the common food, the familiar place, the faces of natural and talkative men made me almost feel as if the council of the seven days had been a bad dream. Tall houses and populous streets lay between me and my last sight of the shameful seven. I was free, in free London, and drinking wine among the free. With a somewhat easier action, I took my hat and stick and strolled down the stairs into the shop below. And there at a small table close up to the blank window in the white street of snow sat the old anarchist professor over a glass of milk with his lifted, livid face. I brushed past him, dashed, uh, dashing open the door and slamming it behind me. I stood outside in the snow. Can that old corpse be following me? Surely Sunday would not be such a fool as the central layman. I set off at a smart pace in the direction of Covent Gardens. As I crossed the great market, the snow increased, growing blinding and bewildering as the afternoon began to darken. By the time I had come at a swinging pace at the beginning of Fleet Street, finding a Sunday tea shop, I had turned into it to take shelter. I ordered another cup of black coffee as an excuse. Scarcely had I done so when Professor de Worms hobbled heavily into the shop, sat down with difficulty and ordered a glass of milk. I'd seen no cab following. I'd heard no wheels outside the shop. To all mortal appearances, the man had come on foot. But the old man could only walk like a snail, and I'd walk like the wind. I started up and half crazy with the contradiction and mirror arithmetic swung out of the swinging doors. An omnibus going to the bank went rattling by. I had a violent run of a hundred yards to reach it, but I managed to spring swaying under the splashboard and... Pausing for an instant to pant, I climbed onto the top. When I'd been seated for about half a minute, I heard behind me a sort of heavy and asthmatic breathing. Turning sharply, I saw rising gradually higher and higher upon the under steps a top hat soiled in dripping white snow, and under the shadow of its brim the short-sighted face and shaky shoulders of Professor de Worms. He led himself into a seat with characteristic care and wrapped himself up to the chin in the Macintosh rug. I ran down the steps. I was too bewildered to look back or to reason. I rushed into one of the little courts at the side of Fleet Street as a rabbit rushes into a hole. I had a vague idea of this incomprehensible old jack-in-the-box was really pursuing me, that in that labyrinth of little streets I could soon throw him off the scent. I dived in and out of those crooked lanes, which were more like cracks than thoroughfares, and by the time that I'd completed about 20 alternate angles and described an unthinkable polygon, I paused to listen for any sound of pursuit. There was none. There could not in any case have been much, for the little streets were thick with the soundless snow. Somewhere behind Red Lion Court, however, I noticed a place where some energetic citizen had cleared away the snow for a space of about 20 yards, leaving the wet, glistening cobblestones. I thought a little of this as I passed it, only plunging into yet another arm of the maze. But when a hundred yards further on, I stood still again to listen. My heart stood still also. I heard from that space of rugged stones the clinking, crutch and laboring feet of the infernal cripple. I turned stick in hand to face my pursuer. Professor de Worms came slowly around the corner of the irregular alley behind him. He came nearer and nearer, the lamplight shining on his lifted spectacles, his lifted, patient face. I waited for him as St. George waited for the dragon as a man waits for a final explanation or for death. And the old professor came right up to me and passed me like a total stranger. 
without even a blink of his mournful eyelids. There was something in the silent, unexpected innocence that left me in a final fury. The man's colorless face and manner seemed to assert that the whole following had been an accident. I called out something like, catch me if you can, and went racing across the wide open circus. Concealment was impossible now, and looking back over my shoulder, I could see the black figure of the old gentleman coming after me with long, swinging strides, like a man winning a mile race. But the head upon that bounding body was still pale, grave, and professional, like the head of a lecture upon the body of a halkin. This outrageous tr chase sped across Ludgate Circus, up Ludgate Hill, around St. Paul's Cathedral, along Sheepside. Then I broke away towards the river and ended almost down to the docks. Then I saw the yellow panes of a low-lighted public house, flung myself into it, <coughs> ordered beer. It was a foul tavern, a place where opium might be smoked and knives drawn. A moment later, Professor de Worms entered the place, sat down carefully, and asked for a glass of milk. I found myself finally established in a chair and opposite to me, fixed and final also, the lifted eyebrows and leaden eyelids of the professor. Are you a policeman? <laughs> a policeman? Whatever made you think of a policeman in connection with me? The process was simple enough. I thought you looked like a policeman. I think so now. But did I take a policeman's hat by mistake out of the restaurant? Why must I be a policeman? Oh, do, do let me be a postman, but... <laughs> perhaps I misunderstood the delicacies of your German philosophy. In an evolutionary sense, of the ape fades so gradually into the policeman that I myself can never detect the shade. The monkey is only the policeman that might have been. I don't mind being the policeman that might have been. Are you in the police service? Are you a detective? <laughs> Your suggestion is ridiculous. Why on earth... Did you hear me ask a plain question, you paltering spy? Are you or are you not a police detective? No. You swear it? You swear it? If you swear falsely, you will be damned. Will you be sure that the devil dances at your funeral? Will you see that this nightmare sits on your grave? You are an anarchist. You are a dynamiter. Above all, you are not in any sense a detective. You are not in the British police. I am not in the British police. Professor de Worms fell back in his chair with a curious air of kindly collapse. Uh, that's a pity, because I am... Because you're what? I am a policeman. Last crusade. And with these words, he laid on the table before me a blue card. And I knew simultaneously that I was a fool and a free man. I took my own police ticket from my own pocket and threw it on the table. Oh, I understand now, of course, you're not an old man at all. I can't take my face off here. It's rather an elaborate makeup. As to whether I'm an old man, that's not for me to say. I was 38, my last birthday. Uh, did you know that that man Gogol was one of us? No, but didn't you? I knew no more than the dead. I thought the president was talking about me. And I thought he was talking about me. I had my hand on a revolver all the time. So had I. And so had Gogol, evidently. Why, there were three of us there. Three out of seven is a fighting number. If we had only known that we were three. We were three. If we'd been 300, we still could have done nothing. Oh, not if we were 300 against four? No, not if we were 300 against Sunday. Oh, Professor, it's intolerable. Are you afraid of this man? Yes, I am. So are you. Yes. Yes, you're right. I am afraid of him. Therefore, I swear by God that I'll seek out this man in my fear until I find him and strike him on the mouth. If heaven were his throne and the earth's footstool, I swear that I'd pull him down. How? Oh, why? Because I am afraid of him. And no man should leave in the universe anything of which he is afraid. Have you any idea exactly what you're going to do? Yes, I'm going to prevent this bomb being thrown in Paris. Have you any conception how? No. You remember, of course, that when we broke up rather hurriedly, the whole arrangement for the atrocities were left in the private hands of the Marquis and Dr. Bull. The Marquis is by this time probably crossing the channel. But where he will go and what he will do, it is doubtful even the President knows. Certainly we don't. The only man who does know is Dr. Bull. Confounded, and we don't know where he is. Yes, I know where he is myself. Will you tell me? I'll take you there. What do you mean? Will you join me? Will you take the risk? Young man... You think that it is possible to pull down the president. I know that it is impossible, and I'm going to try it. And opening the tavern door, which led into the blast of bitter air, we went out together into the dark streets. We're too late. The hygienic doctor is gone to bed. Well, what do you mean? Does he live over there, then? Yes, behind that particular window, which you can't see. Come along, get some dinner. We must call on him tomorrow morning. 
The professor led me to a very respectable inn, and in that place we dined and slept both very thoroughly. Can you play the piano? Yes, I'm supposed to have a good touch. It would have done just as well if you could work a typewriter. <laughs> Thank you, you flatter me. Listen to me and remember who we have to see tomorrow. You and I are going tomorrow to attempt something which is very much more dangerous than trying to steal the crown jewels out of the tower. We are trying to steal a secret from a very sharp, very strong, and very wicked man. I believe there is no man except the president, of course, who is so seriously startling and formidable as that little grinning fellow in goggles. Depend on it, Sunday was not asleep. I wonder if he ever sleeps. When he locked up all the plans of this outrage in the round, blockhead, black head of Dr. Bull. <laughs> and, uh, and do you think that this unique monster will be soothed if I play the piano to him? Don't be an ass. I mentioned the piano because it gives <clears throat> one quick and independent fingers. Sam, if we're to go through this interview and come out sane or alive, we must have some code of signals between us that this brute will not see. I have made a rough alphabetical cipher corresponding to the five fingers like this, see? B. A. D. Bad. A word which we may frequently require. I began to study the scheme and it didn't take me long to learn how we might convey simple messages by what would seem to be idle taps upon a table or knee. We must have several word signs, words that we're likely to want, fine shades of meaning. Uh, my favorite word is coeval. What's yours? Do stop. You don't know how serious this is. Lush, too. We must have lush. Word uh, applied to grass, don't you know? You imagine that we're going to talk to Dr. Bull about grass? Well, I wish this language of yours had a wider scope. I suppose we couldn't extend it from the fingers to the toes. That would involve pulling off our boots and socks during the conversation, which, however, unobtrusively performed... Time, go to bed. I sat up, however, for a considerable time mastering the new code. I was awakened next morning while the east was still sealed with darkness and found my gray-bearded ally standing like a ghost beside my bed. I dreamt of that alphabet of yours. Uh, did it take you long to make it up? I, I say, did it take you long in inventing all this? I'm considered good at these things, and it was a good hour's grind. Uh, uh, did you learn it on the spot? Uh, how long did it take you? Confound you, can't you answer? My first thought was that the professor had gone mad, but my second thought was more frightful. After all, what did I know about this queer creature whom I had heedlessly accepted as a friend? How improbable it was that there should be another friend there beside Gogol. I stood and strained my ears in this heartless silence. I almost fancied I could hear dynamite has come to capture me, shifting softly in the corridor outside. Then my eyes strayed downward, though the professor himself stood there as voiceless as a statue. His five dumb fingers were dancing alive upon the dead table. I watched the twinkling movements of the talking hand and read clearly the message. I will only talk like this. You must get used to it. I wrapped out the answer. All right, let's go out to breakfast. Dr. Bull was sitting at a table. The strong white light of morning coming from one side, creating sharp shadows, made him seem both more pale and more angular than he'd looked at the breakfast on the balcony. Thus the two black glasses that encased his eyes might really have been black cavities in his skull, making him look like a death's head. And indeed, if ever death himself sat writing at a wooden table, it might have been he. He looked up and smiled brightly as we came in. The quiet good humor of his manner left us helpless. I am sorry to disturb you so early, comrade. You have no doubt made all the arrangements for the Paris affair. We have information which renders intolerable anything in the nature of a moment's delay. Dr. Bull smiled again. Please do not think me excessively abrupt, but I advise you to alter those plans, or if it is too late for that, to follow your agent with all the support you can get from him. Comrade Syme and I have had experience which it would take more time to recount than we can afford if we are to act on it. I will, however, relate the occurrence in detail, even at the risk of losing time, if you really feel that it is essential to the understanding of the problem we have to discuss. 
He was spinning out his sentences, making them intolerably long and lingering in the hope of maddening the practical little doctor with an explosion of impatience which might show his hand. But the little doctor continued only to stare and smile, and the monologue was uphill work. I began to feel a new despair. Here was daylight. Here was a healthy, square-shouldered man in tweeds, not old, save for the accent of his ugly spectacles, not glaring or grinning at all, but smiling steadily and not saying a word. Rather than me... His words he seemed to be dragging out like words in an anthem, but I saw his long fingers rattle quickly in the edge of a crazy table. I read the message. Go on, go on. This devil has sucked me dry. Yes, uh, yes, the thing really happened to me. I had the good fortune to fall into conversation with the detective who took me, thanks to my hat, for a respectable person. Wishing to clinch my reputation for respectability, I made him very drunk at the Savoy. Under this influence, he became friendly and told me in so many words that within a day or two, they hoped to arrest the Marquis in France. So unless you or I can get on his track... All I... right, I'll try again. The but doctor was still smiling in the most friendly way and behind his... Boston, come here and listen. ...was still impenetrable. Sam immediately brought this information to me, and we came here together to see what use you would be inclined to make of it. It seems to be unquestionably urgent. I have an intuition. And sit on it. It's quite extraordinary. Extraordinary. I'm a poet. You're a dead man. You scarcely realize how poetic my intuition is. It has that sudden quality we sometimes feel in the coming of spring. Perhaps I should rather say that it resembles that sudden smell of the sea which may be found in the heart of lush woods. Or yet again, it is positive as of the passionate red hair of a beautiful woman. The professor was continuing his speech, but in the middle of it I decided to act. Dr. Bull! The doctor's sleek and smiling head did not move, but I could have sworn that under his dark glasses his eyes darted towards me. Dr. Bull, would you do me a small favor? Would you be so kind as to take off your spectacles? For a few seconds there was a silence in which one could hear a pin drop split once by, by the, the sing single hoot of a distant steamer on the Thames. Then Dr. Bull rose slowly, still smiling, and took off his spectacles. The professor had also started to his feet, forgetful of his supposed paralysis. We saw sitting in the chair before us a very boyish-looking young man with very frank and happy hazel eyes, an open expression, cockney clothes like those of a city clerk, and an unquestionable breath about him being very good and rather commonplace. The smile was still there, but it might have been the first smile of a baby. I knew I was a poet. I knew my intuition was as infallible as the Pope. It was the spectacles that did it. It was all the spectacles, given those beastly black eyes, and all the rest of him... It his health and his jolly looks made him a live devil among dead ones. Certainly does make a queer difference. But as regards the project of Dr. Bull... Project be damned. Look at him. Look at his face. Look at his collar. Look at his blessed boots. You don't suppose, do you, that the thing's an anarchist? Time. Why, by God, I'll take the risk of that myself. Dr. Bull, I'm a police officer. There's my card. Well, I'm awfully glad you came so early, for we can all start for France together. Yes, I'm in the force, all right. And he flicked a blue card towards us lightly as a matter of form. The last crusade... Lord God Almighty, if this is all right, there were more damn detectives than there are damn dynamiters at the damn council. We might easily have fought. We were only four against three. No, we're not four against three. We're not so lucky. We were four against one. You were already on the Calais boat before conversation flowed freely. I'd already arranged to go to France for my lunch, but I'm delighted to have someone to lunch with me. You see, I had to send that beast, the Marquis, over with his bum because the president had his eye on me, though God knows how. I tell you, you can say what you like, that fellow sold himself to the devil. He can be in six places at once. So you sent the Marquis off, I understand. Was it long ago? Shall we be in time to catch him? Yes, I've timed it all. He'll still be at Calais when we arrive. But when do we catch him at Calais? What are we going to do? Theoretically, I suppose we ought to call the police. Not I. Theoretically, I ought to drown myself first. I promised a poor fellow as a real modern pessimist on my word of honor not to tell the police. And I can't break my word to a modern pessimist. It's like breaking one's word to a child. I'm in the same boat. I tried to tell the police, and I couldn't because of some silly oath I took. I gave my promise to the secretary. You know him, the man who smiles upside down. The fact that comes of it is this. If we are three... All alone on this planet. Gogol is gone. God knows where. Perhaps the president has smashed him like a fly. Now, we must do something to keep the Marquis in Calais till tomorrow midday. We cannot denounce him as a dynamiter. We cannot pretend to keep him on anarchist business. He might swallow much in that way, but not the notion of stopping in Calais while the king went safely through Paris. The only thing I can see is, is to actually take advantage of the very things that are in the Marquis' favor. I'm going to profit by the fact that he is a nobleman 
and has many friends and moves in the best society. What the devil are you talking about? The Symes are first mentioned in the 14th century. Since 1350, the tree is quite clear. He's gone off his head. We're just in shore. Oh, you you seek are joking in the wrong place. The house of Saint Eustache also is very ancient. <laughs> the Marquis cannot deny that he is a gentleman, and in order to put the matter of my social position quite beyond a doubt, I propose at the earliest opportunity to knock his hat off. But here we are in the harbor. <clears throat> A band was playing in a café chantant hidden somewhere among the trees where we sat. The Marquis de Saint-Justas. The man had two companions, solemn Frenchmen in silk hats. You are Mr. Saim, I think. And you are the Marquis de Saint-Justas. Permit me to pull your nose. Which I attempted to do, but the two men in top hats held me back. This man has insulted me. Insulted you? When? Oh, just now, he insulted my mother. Insulted your mother? Well, anyhow, my aunt. But how could the Marquis have insulted your aunt just now? He has been sitting here all the time. Ah, it was what he said. I said nothing at all except about the band. I only said that I like Wagner, played well. It was an illusion to my family. My aunt played Wagner badly. It was a painful subject. We're always being insulted about it. This seems most extraordinary. Oh, I assure you, the whole of your conversation was simply packed with sinister allusions to my aunt's weaknesses. Oh, this is nonsense. I, for one, have said nothing for half an hour except Accent. that I like the singing of that girl with black hair. Well, there you are again. My aunt's was red. It Accent. seems to me that you are simply make, seeking a pretext to insult the Marquis. By George, what a clever chap you were. Seeking a quarrel with me, by God. Then there was never a man who had to seek long. These gentlemen will perhaps act for me. There are still four hours of daylight. Let us fight this evening. Marquis, your action is worthy of your fame and blood. Permit me to consult for a moment with the gentleman in whose hands I shall place myself. I rejoin my companions. Sam, what are you up to? Now listen carefully. You're my seconds. You must insist and insist absolutely on the duel coming off after seven tomorrow. So as to give me the chance of preventing him from catching the 745 for Paris. If he misses that, he misses his crime. He can't refuse you. But he will choose a field somewhere near a wayside station where he can pick up a train. He's a very good swordsman and will trust to killing me in time to catch it. But I think I can keep him in play at any rate until the train is lost. Then perhaps he may kill me to console his feelings. You understand? Very well then. Let me introduce you to some charming friends of mine. Leading them quickly across the parade, I presented them to the Marquis seconds by two very aristocratic names of which they had not previously heard. At 7.20, we met on a small meadow not far from the railway. I had made up my mind that I could avoid disabling the Marquis and prevent the Marquis from disabling me for at least 20 minutes. In 20 minutes, the Paris train would have gone by. Pest, let us stop talking and begin. I understood his rude impatience and instinctively looked over my shoulder to see that the train was coming in sight, but there was no smoke on the horizon. Engage! I'm not a bad fighter, and every now and then I could almost fancy that I felt my point go home. But there was no blood on the blade or shirt. At the risk of losing all the Marquis flashed one glance over his shoulder at the line of the railway on his right. Then he turned on me a face transfigured to that of a fiend and began to fight as if with twenty weapons. The Paris train was in sight. The Marquis's morbid energy overreached itself. There was no doubt about the hit this time. My sword actually bent under the weight of the Marquis's body, which it had pierced. I was as certain that I had struck my blade into an enemy as a gardener that had stuck his spade into the ground, yet there was no blood on it at all. The Marquis fought wildly and even weakly, and he constantly looked away at the railway line, almost as if he feared the train more than the pointed steel. He could have solved the riddle of my own bloodless sword. I aimed less at the Marquis's body and more at his throat and head. A minute and a half afterwards, I felt the point end of the man's neck below the jaw. It came out clean. I thrust again and made what should have been a bloody scar on the Marquis's cheek. But there was no scar. Stop. I want to say something. What is the matter? Has there been foul play? There has been foul, foul play somewhere. Our principal has wounded the Marquis four times at least, and he is none the worse. Please let me speak. It is rather important. Mr. Symes, we are fighting today, if I remember right, because you expressed a wish which I thought irrational to pull my nose. Would you oblige me by pulling my nose now? As quickly as possible. I have to catch a train. I protest that this is most irregular. Will you or will you not pull my nose? Come, 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 Mr. Symes. You wanted to do it? Do it. You can have no concern. Don't be so selfish. Pull my nose at once when I ask you. And the Marquis bent slightly forward. The train shouldn't stop with a fascinating smile. Then, the Paris train, panting and groaning, had grated into a little station behind the neighboring hill. I took two paces forward and seized the Roman nose of this remarkable nobleman. I pulled it hard and it came off in my hand. I stood for some seconds with a foolish solemnity, with the pasteboard proboscis still between my fingers looking at it, while the sun and the clouds and the wooded hills looked down upon this imbecile scene. The Marquis broke the silence. If anyone has use for my left eyebrow, he can have it. Do accept my left eyebrow. It is the kind of thing that might come in useful someday. The Marquis was recklessly throwing parts of himself right and left about the field. You are making a mistake. 
But it can't be explained just now. I tell you the train has just come into the station. Yes, and the train shall go out of the station. It shall go out without you. We know well enough for what devil's work. you drive me mad? The train! You shall not go by the train. You great, flat, blasted, blear-eyed, blundering, thundering, brainless, godforsaken, doddering, damn fool. Great, silly, pink-faced, toe-headed turnip. You, you shall not go by this train. But why the infernal blazes should I want to go by the train? We know all. You're going to Paris to throw a bar. Going to Jericho to throw a jabberwock. You all got softening of the brain that you don't realize what I am? Did you really think I wanted to catch that train? Twenty Paris trains might go by for me, damn Paris trains. Then what do you care about? What did I care about? I didn't care about catching the train. I cared about whether the train caught me, and now, by God, it has caught me. Now, what do you mean by saying the train has caught you? It may be my literary fancy, but somehow I fancy that it ought to mean something. It means everything, the end of everything. Sunday has us now in the hollow of his hand. Us? What do you mean by us? The police, of course. I'm Inspector Ratcliffe. My name's pretty well known to the police, and I can see well enough that you belong to them. But if there's, if there's any doubt about my position, I have a card. But my God, if this is true, the whole Bally Lollis and the Anarchist Council were against anarchy. Every born man was a detective except the president and his personal secretary. What can it mean? It means that we're all struck dead. Don't you know, Sunday? I tell you, he's bought every trust. He's captured every cable. He has control of every railway line, especially of that railway line. The whole movement was controlled by him. Half the world was ready to rise for him. But there were just five people, perhaps, who could have resisted him. And the old devil put them on the Supreme Council to waste their time in watching each other. Sunday knew that the professor would chase Syme through London, that Syme would fight me in France, and he was combining great masses of capital and seizing great lines of telegraphy while we five idiots were running around after each other like a lot of confounded babies playing blind man's buff. Well? Well, he's found us playing blind man's buff today in a field of great rustic beauty and extreme solitude. It's probably captured the world. It only remains to him to capture this field and all the fools in it. Since you really want to know what was my objection to the arrival of that train, I'll tell you. My objection was that Sunday or his secretary has just this moment got out of it. We all turned our eyes toward the far-off station. A considerable bulk of people seemed to be moving in our direction. It can't be as bad as you say. There are a good number of them, certainly. But they may be easily the ordinary tourists. Oh, do ordinary tourists wear black masks halfway down the face? Most men in the advancing mob really looked ordinary enough, but it is quite true that two or three of the leaders in front wore black masks. The police station. Please, God, we may get there. I can't believe it. This is nonsense. The plain people of a peaceable French town. God, someone has shot at us. Did he not interrupt conversation? Pray resume your remarks, Dr. Bull. You were talking, I think, about the plain people of a peaceful French town. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. A fastidious person might even call it unpleasant. However, I suppose that's the police station over there. We'd better run for it. We'll never get there. What do you mean? They have two rows of armed men across the road already. I can see them from here. The whole town's in arms. Well, what do you think now? I think that I am sitting in a small cushioned cell and that the doctor can't make much of my case. Stop. Stop. Here comes the here police. Comes the police. They're charging the mob. No. They're forming along the parade. They have unslung their carbine. Yes, they're going to fire on us. I am in the padded cell. What does it matter who is mad or who is sane? We shall all be dead soon. You're quite hopeless then? No. Oddly enough, I'm not quite hopeless. There's one little hope that I cannot get out of my mind. The power of this whole planet is against us. Yet I cannot help wondering whether this one silly little hope is hopeless yet. In what or whom is your hope? In a man I never saw. I know what you mean. The man from headquarters, the man in the dark room. But Sunday must have killed him by now. Perhaps. But if so, he was the only man whom Sunday found it hard to kill. The mob, advancing silently, was almost on top of us. Charge the anarchists! Charge the anarchists! There was no doubt of it. The leader was Saturday, secretary of the council. Under the black mask, his mouth was working horribly. Saturday! Stop! 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 Charge the anarchists! Swords! Let us die, for our time has come to die. There's some There's mistake, some mistake Sime. Sime. I hardly think you understand your position. I arrest you in the name of the law. Of the law? Certainly. I am a detective from Scotland Yard. He took a small card from his pocket. What do you suppose we are? You are, as I know from a fact, members of the Supreme Anarchist Council. Disguised as one of you, I... There never was any Supreme Anarchist Council. We were all a lot of silly policemen looking at each other. Yes. And all these nice people who have been peppering us with shot thought we were the dynamiters. I knew I couldn't be wrong about the mob. Vulgar people never are mad. I'm vulgar myself, and I know. I'm now going on shore to stand a drink to everybody here. I can't make head of The next of... morning, five bewildered but hilarious detectives returned to London. I can't make head or tail of old Sonny's little game any more than you can. But whatever else Sunday's is, he isn't a blameless citizen, damn it. 
Do you remember his face? I grant you that I've never been able to forget it. Well, I suppose we can find out soon. For tomorrow, we have our next general meeting. Yes, I suppose you're right. I suppose we might find out from him. But I confess that I should feel a bit afraid of asking Sunday who he really is. Why? For fear of bombs? No, for fear he might tell me. Let us have some drinks. I tell you, I've seen him. Oh, not the president. Not so bad as that. Not so bad as that. I've got him here. Got whom here? Harry Mann, man that used to be Harry Mann. Google. Here he is. Why do you worry with me? You've expelled me as a spy. We're all spies. We're all spies. Come and have a drink. Next morning, the battalion of the reunited six marched stolidly towards the hotel in Lister Square. Well, this is more cheerful. We are six men going to ask one man what he means. I think it's a bit queerer than that. I think it's six men going to ask one man what they mean. We turned in silence to the square. And though the balcony was in the opposite corner, we saw at once the little balcony and a figure that looked over too big for it. He was sitting alone with bent head, poring over a newspaper, but all his counselors who had come to vote him down crossed that square as if we were watched out of heaven by a hundred eyes. We went up the dark stair in silence and came out simultaneously into the broad sunlight of the morning and the broad sunlight of Sunday's smile. Delightful. So pleased to see you all. What an exquisite day it is. Is the king dead? No, sir. There has been no massacre. I bring you news of no such disgusting spectacles. Disgusting spectacles? You mean Dr. Bull's spectacles? My spectacles are black, Godly, but I'm not. Look at my face. I dare say it is the sort of face that grows on one. In fact, it grows on you. I dare say it will grow on me someday. We have come to know what all this means. Who are you? What are you? Why did you get us all here? Do you know who and what we are? Are you a half-witted man playing the conspirator? Or are you a clever man playing the fool? Candidates are only required to answer eight out of the 17 questions on the paper. As far as I can make out, you want me to tell you what I am and what you are and what this table is and what this council is and what this world is, for all I know. Well... I will go so far as to rend the veil of one mystery. If you want to know what you are, you're a set of highly well-intentioned young jackasses. And you? What are you? I? What am I? The president rose slowly to an incredible height like some enormous wave about to arch above us and break. You want to know what I am, do you? Bull, you're a man of science. Grab in the roots of those trees and find out the truth about them. Syme, you are a poet. Stare at those morning clouds and tell me the truth about morning clouds. But I tell you this, that you will have found out the truth of the last tree in the topmost cloud before the truth about me. You will understand the sea and I shall still be a riddle. You shall know what the stars are and not know what I have. Since the beginning of the world, all men have hunted me like a wolf. Kings and sages and poets and lawgivers, all the churches and all the philosophies. But I have never been caught yet, and the skies will fall in the time I turn to bay. I have given them a good run for their money, and I will now. Before any of us could move, the monstrous man had swung himself over the balustrade of the balcony. Yet before he dropped, he pulled himself up again, as on a horizontal bar, and thrusting his great chin over the edge of the balcony... There's one thing I'll tell you, though, about who I am. I am the man in the dark room who made you all policemen. And with that, he fell from the balcony, bouncing on the stones below like a great ball of Indian rubber, and went bounding off toward the corner of the Alhambra, where he hailed a handsome cab and sprang inside it. Of course, we all followed him, and at the highest ecstasy of speed, Sunday turned and sticking his great grinning head out of the cab, cab, with white hair whistling in the wind, he made a horrible face at us, flung a ball of paper at me and vanished. I caught the paper. What does it say, Sime? Anything but this. No one would regret anything in the nature of an interference by the archdeacon more than I. I trust it will not come to that. But for the last time, where are your galoshes? The thing is too bad, especially after what Uncle said. A fire engine appeared, and the president leaped incredibly from his handsome...
caught the back of the engine and slung himself onto it. After him. There's no mistaking the fire engine. Our cabin whipped up their horses and the proprietor on the sound. And the president acknowledging this proximity by coming to the back of the fire engine, bowing repeatedly, kissing his hand, and finally flinging a neatly folded knot into note into the bosom of Inspector Ratcliffe, formerly the Marquis. Read it. Read it. Fly at once. The truth Quiet about on your the sound. trouser stretches is known. A friend. What place is this? Sunday had jumped from the fire engine over an iron gate and we'd follow him to a kind of park. Can it be the old devil's house? I hear the most horrible noises, like devils laughing and sneezing and blowing their devilish no noses. His dog's barking, of course. Why not say his black beetles barking, snails barking, geraniums barking? Listen to that. Is that a dog? Anybody's dog? Are you asses, it's a zoo. Keeper in uniform came running along the path. Has he come this Has way? Has he come this way? Has what? The elephant. An elephant has gone mad and run away. What? He has run away with an old gentleman, a poor old gentleman with white hair. What sort of old gentleman? A very large and fat old gentleman in light grey clothes. Well, if he's that particular kind of old gentleman, you may take my word for it that the elephant has not run away with him. He has run away with the elephant. The elephant is not made by God that could run away with him if he did not consent to the elopement. And by thunder, there he is. There was no doubt about it this time. Clean across the space of grass about 200 yards away with a crowd screaming and scampering gaily at his heels went a huge gray elephant at an awful stride. On the back of the bellowing and plunging animal sat President Sunday with all the placidity of a sultan. Have Stop you any of this? You get out of the gate! Through street after street, through district after district, went the prodigy of the flying elephant, calling crowds to every window and driving the traffic left and right, and we followed it. Through the city, out into the suburbs, and finally to a fairgrounds. The president had disappeared. Where has he gone to? A gentleman rushed into the exhibition, sir. Funny gentleman, sir. Asked me to hold his elephant and give me this. To the secretary of the Central Anarchist Committee. Give it to me. When the herring runs a mile, let the secretary smile. When the herring tries to fly, let the secretary die. Rustic proverb. Why the eternal cracky did you let the man in? Do people commonly come to your exhibition riding on mad elephants? Look, Do... look, over there. Look at what? Look at the captive balloon. Why the blazes should I look at the captive balloon? What is there queer about a captive balloon? Nothing except that it isn't captive. Ten thousand devils, he's got into it. The balloon, borne by some chance wind, came right above us, and we could see the great white head of the president peering over the side. He dropped another message. It's for me. Your beauty has not left me indifferent from little snowdrop. I'm not beaten yet. The blasted thing must come down somewhere. Let's follow it. There it goes. It's falling. About twilight, the preposterous thing staggered in the sky and sank from view into the woods. He is dead. And now I know he was my friend. My friend in the dark. Dead. You will not find him dead easily. Oh, if he's cheated us all by getting killed, it would be like one of his larks. And almost at the same moment, all six of us realized that we were not alone in the little wood. Across the square of turf, a tall man was coming towards us, leaning on a strange long staff like a scepter. His advance was very quiet. He might have been one of the shadows of the wood. Gentlemen, my master has a carriage waiting for you in the road just by. Erskine plays that. Who is your master? I was told you knew his name. Where is this carriage? He has been waiting only a few moments. My master has only just come home. All six of us compared notes afterwards and quarreled, but we all agreed that in some unaccountable way the place where we came that night reminded us of our boyhood. It was either this elm top or that crooked path. It was either this scrap of orchard or that shape of a window. But each man of us declared that he could remember this place before he could remember his mother. Refreshments are provided for you in your room. I entered a splendid suite of apartments that seemed to be designed specially for me. I've put out your clothes, sir. Clothes? I have no clothes except these. My master asked me to say that there's a fancy dress ball tonight. You're to be dressed as... Thursday, sir. Dressed as Thursday? It doesn't sound a very warm costume. Oh, yes, sir. The Thursday costume is quite warm, sir. It fastens up to the chin. I was led out into a very large old English garden full of torches and bonfires, by the broken light of which a vast carnival of people were dancing in motley dress. I seemed to see every shape in nature imitated in some crazy costume. There was a man dressed as a windmill with enormous sails. A man dressed as an elephant, a man dressed as a balloon. There was a dancing lamppost, a dancing apple tree, a dancing ship. One would have thought that the untamable tune of some mad magician had set all the common objects of field and street dancing an eternal jig. And long afterwards, when I was middle-aged and at rest, I could never see one of those particular objects, a lamppost or an apple tree or a windmill, 
without thinking that it was strayed reveler from that revel of a masquerade. On one side of the lawn, alive with dancers, was a sort of green bank, like the terrace in such old-fashioned gardens. Along this, in a kind of crescent, stood seven great chairs, the thrones of the seven days. Gogol and Dr. Bull were already in their seats. The professor was just mounting to his. And one by one, the wanderers ascended the bank and sat in their strange seats. As each of us sat down, a roar of enthusiasm rose from the carnival, such as that which crowds receive kings. Cups were clashed and torches shaken and feathered hats flung in the air. The men for whom these thrones were reserved were men crowned with some extraordinary laurels. But the central chair was empty. We do not yet know that he is not <coughs> dead in a field. Almost as I heard the words, I saw the sea of human faces in front of me, a frightful and beautiful alteration, as if heaven had opened behind my head. But Sunday had only passed silently along the front like a shadow and had sat in the central seat. For a long time it seemed for hours that huge masquerade of mankind swayed and stamped in front of us to marching and exultant music. Every couple dancing seemed a separate romance. It might be a fairy dancing with a pillar box or a peasant girl dancing with the moon. But in each case it was somehow as absurd as Alice in Wonderland, yet as grave and kind as a love story. At last, however, the thick crowd began to thin itself. Soon there were only some ten loiterers in the garden, soon only four. Finally, the last stray merrymaker ran into the house, whooping to his companions. The fire faded and the slow, strong stars came out. And the seven strange men were left alone like seven stone statues on our chairs of stone. Not one of us had spoken a word. We seemed in no haste to do so, but heard in silence the hum of insects and the distant song of a bird. Then Sunday spoke, but so dreamily that he might have been continuing a conversation rather than beginning one. We will eat and drink later. Let us remain together a little. We who have loved each other so sadly and have fought so long. I seem to remember only centuries of heroic war in which you were always heroes. Epic on epic, Iliad on Iliad, and you always brothers in arms. Whether it was but recently, for time is nothing, or at the beginning of the world, I sent you out to war. I sat in the darkness where there is not any created thing. And to you, I was only a voice commanding valor and an unnatural virtue. You heard the voice in the dark, and you never heard it again. The sun in heaven denied it. The earth and sky denied it. All human wisdom denied it. And when I met you in the daylight, I denied it myself. But you were men. You did not forget your secret honor, though the whole cosmos turned an engine of torture to tear it out of you. I knew how near you were to hell. I know how you, Thursday, crossed swords with King Satan, and how you, Wednesday, named me in the hour without hope. There was a complete silence in the starlit garden, and then the black-browed secretary implacable, turned in his chair towards Sunday. Who and what are you? I am the Sabbath. I am the peace of God. I know what you mean. It's exactly that that I cannot forgive you. I know you are dis your contentment, optimism. What do they call the thing? An ultimate reconciliation. Well, I am not reconciled. If you were the man in the dark room, why were you also Sunday, an offense to the sunlight? Oh, I can forgive God his anger, though it destroyed nations, but I cannot forgive his peace. Sunday answered not a word, but very slowly he turned his face of stone upon me as if asking a question. No, I do not feel fierce like that. I'm grateful to you, not only for wine and hospitality here, but for many a fine scamper and free fight. But I should like to know, my soul and heart are as happy and quiet here as this old garden, but my reason is still crying out. 
I should like to know. It seems so silly that you should have been on both sides and fought yourself. I understand nothing, but I am happy. In fact, I am going to sleep. No, I'm not happy because I don't understand. You let me stray a little too near to hell. I wish I knew why I was hurt so much. I have heard your complaints in order. And here, I think, comes another to complain. We will hear him also. The falling fire threw a last long gleam like a bar of burning gold across the dim grass. Against this fiery band was outlined in utter black the advancing legs of a black-clad figure. It was only when he had come quite close to the crescent of the seven and flung up his face to look at us that I saw with thunderstruck clearness that the face was the broad, almost ape-like face of my old friend Gregory. Gregory! Why? This is the real anarchist! Yes, I am the real anarchist. And there came a day when the Son of God came before the Lord and Satan also came with him. All right! I am a destroyer. I would destroy the world if I could. Oh, most unhappy man. Try to be happy. You have red hair like your sister. My red hair like red flames shall burn up the world. I thought I hated everything more than common men can hate anything. But I find that I do not hate everything as much as I hate you. I never hated you. You, you never hated because you never lived. I know what you are, all of you, from first to last. You are the people in power. You are the police, the great, fat, smiling men in blue and buttons. You are the law, and you sit in your chairs of stone and have never come down from them. You're the seven angels of heaven, and you've had no troubles. Oh, I could forgive you everything, you that rule all mankind, if I could feel for once that you had suffered for one hour a real agony, such as I... I see everything. Everything that there is. Why does each thing on earth war against each other thing? Why does each small thing in the world have to fight against the world itself? Why does a fly have to fight the whole universe? Why does a dandelion have to fight the whole universe? For the same reason that I had to be alone in the dreadful council of the days, so that each thing that obeys law may have the glory and isolation of the anarchist, so that the real lie of Satan may be flung back in the face of the blasphemer, so that by tears and torture we may earn the right to say to this accuser, we also have suffered. It is not true that we have never been broken. We have been broken upon the wheel. It is not true that we have never descended from these thrones. We have descended into hell. I repel the slander. We have not been happy. I can answer for every one of the great gods of law whom he has accused. At least... And I saw suddenly the great face of Sunday. Have you ever suffered? As I gazed... The great face grew to an awful size, larger than the colossal mask of Memon, which had made me scream as a child. It grew larger and larger, filling the whole sky. Then everything went black. Only in the blackness before it entirely destroyed my brain, I seemed to hear a distant voice saying a commonplace text that I had heard somewhere. Can ye drink of the cup? that I drink of. When men in books awake from a vision, they commonly find themselves in some place in which they might have fallen asleep. I could only remember that gradually and naturally I knew that I was and had been walking along a country lane with an easy and conversational companion. It was the red-haired poet Gregory. Dawn was breaking over everything in colors at once clear and timid, as if nature made a first attempt at yellow and a first attempt at rose. A breeze blew so clean and sweet that one could not think that it blew from the sky. It blew rather through some hole in the sky. I felt a simple surprise when I saw rising all round me on both sides of the road the red, irregular buildings of Saffron Park. I walked by instinct along one white road on which early birds hopped and sang and found myself outside a fenced garden. And there I saw the sister of Gregory, the girl with the gold-red hair cutting lilac before breakfast with the great unconscious gravity of a girl. It's the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hey, 